Unit 8, Part 2. Uh, in this part, we'll look at uh, tea and chocolate in continuing our look at uh, stimulating beverages. Tea comes from a shrub called Camellia sinensis, and it is made from the leaves of that shrub. Tea is native to Asia. It was discovered, according to the Chinese, by Emperor Shen Nung in 2732 BC, when the leaf of a shrub fell into a pot of hot water. Another legend, and this one's my favorite, uh, has it that a Buddhist priest vowed to stay awake for seven years to contemplate Buddha. But after five years, he was finding it hard to stay awake. Uh, he chewed the leaves of a nearby shrub and discovered he was then able to fulfill his vow. Uh, the spread of tea. It reached Europe sometime around 1610, again with the Dutch traders. Um, it reached England 40 years later in about 1650. By that time, there were already many coffee houses uh, in London, and the coffee houses were the first to bring tea to the public. 1680, this is 30 years after it first reached England, the British imported only 100 pounds of tea per that, in that year. By 1700, they were importing 14 million pounds of tea per year. Tea leaves have high concentrations of tannins, and they are believed to discourage uh, herbivores from eating the tea plant. Um, could range from anything from caterpillars to cows. Uh, they don't like the taste of tannins. They don't eat the tea plant. Two inventions in 1904, tea bags and ice cubes, caused a revolution in tea drinking in the U.S., the tea bag, it's interesting to note, um, was sort of an accidental invention. A tea merchant sent samples of his various teas to customers sewn up in little silk bags. The customers, not knowing exactly what the bags were for, just dunked the bag uh, with the tea inside into hot water, and bingo, tea bags were invented. Also, in addition to camellia, tea is sometimes made from holly tree leaves. Tea has several positive health effects. Black tea lowers total and LDL cholesterol levels. LDL is the bad cholesterol. A chemical compound in tea can boost the body's immune response to pathogens. Tea has no effect on HDL cholesterol levels. And tea has lower concentrations of caffeine than coffee, but it's higher than most standard colas. Over the centuries, tea drinking has given rise to sometimes elaborate ceremonies. The Japanese tea ceremony is probably the height of serving tea. It's not meant so much as a ceremony about drinking or consuming tea as it is a ceremony to convey respect to those to whom you are serving the tea. British tea time is another somewhat less ceremonial observation of tea drinking. Here's a photograph of some tea leaves. And the smaller the leaf, the more expensive it is. It makes sense because the smaller leaves can produce less tea. The types of tea are graded according to uh, the size of the leaf and the degree of um, roasting that the leaves undergo uh, in the process of making the leaves into what we call tea. The darkest tea, and the most common in the U.S., is called black tea. The lightest tea is yellow tea. Between those two, there are grades of green and oolong. Here's a photograph of the tea leaves crushed and prepared for tea at the bottom um, with the grades of tea above them from yellow tea, green tea, oolong tea, black tea. Tea is grown commercially on tea plantations. And as with coffee, the place where tea likes to grow the best 
makes the use of machinery difficult. So the growing and harvesting um, is typically done by hand. And it's best done by hand so that it can be graded as it's picked. So the larger leaves can go into one basket or bag, the smaller leaves go into another, and then that grading can be done in the field as it's being picked, doesn't have to be done later in a preparation facility. This photograph shows a tea plantation, and you can see the individual tea plants, um, shrubs or groups of shrubs, you know, these little bumps that you see here. And in the farther hills, you know, it's grown in these lines. And you can see from the terrain, it would make harvesting by machine quite difficult. But a person can walk along those hills and drop the tea bags into a basket or bag. This photograph shows a tea harvest near the Black Sea in 1905. And the harvesting methods haven't changed a great deal since then. Notice the, the tea harvesters each have a basket. They're picking the proper leaves, dropping them in the basket. Here's a chart showing tea production around the world. As of 2007, China was the largest producer of tea in that year. India, a relatively close second. Uh, Kenya, coming in in third place, um, quite far back from India. Chocolate. Chocolate is our last of the stimulating beverages that we're talking about. Um, it, like tea and coffee, contains some caffeine. Chocolate is derived from the partially fermented and then dried and roasted seeds or beans of the Theobroma cacao tree. This tree is native to Central and South America. The Mayans had chocolate. They consumed it as a drink, but as an unsweetened drink. If you know what chocolate without any sugar tastes like, it uh, doesn't seem that that would be that pleasant of a drink. This shows the Theobroma cacao tree um, with the pods on it in various stages of ripening. The larger, more orangish pods are riper than the smaller, more purple pods. These pods contain numerous seeds, unlike coffee where you get a, one seed per bean. Um, there are numerous seeds per pod, and that's the part that's used to make chocolate and that contains caffeine. Here are some cacao beans that have been roasted, much larger than coffee beans. Chocolate also has health effects, um, may have a positive effect on the circulatory system. It also contains antioxidants, which may have anti-cancer effects. It's anti-diarrheal. But since the main ingredient in most chocolate that we consume is sugar, it can also have detrimental effects when consumed in quantity. Here's a photograph of one of the uh, Theobroma cacao pods cut open to uh, expose the seeds. And you can see there are numerous seeds and much larger seeds than we would find, for instance, in coffee. So, summing up, Caffeine, which exists in all of these drinks, it's a naturally occurring plant alkaloid compound. It's a central nervous system stimulant. As such, it increases the heart rate, increases blood pressure, stimulates respiration, and constricts blood vessels. It can improve athletic performance by drawing on fat reserves for energy. This is particularly important for long-term uh, athletic contests uh, that last for a couple of hours. So it'd be, uh, you know, towards the end of a uh, football game, for instance, or a uh, bicycle race or a uh, marathon, that sort of thing. The body doesn't normally draw on fat reserves uh, for any source of quick energy uh, because it takes some effort by the body to convert that fat into uh, compounds the sugars primarily that would provide that energy. 
Um, caffeine helps to streamline that process a bit and makes those fat reserves available not as instant boosts of energy, but as a source of um, energy sort of in an ongoing contest. It also can increase motor skills of conditioned reflexes. Conditioned reflexes are those things that athletes would talk about as muscle memory. Um, certain things that you do over and over repeatedly, um, throwing a baseball, swinging a golf club, <clears throat> certain things that you do often enough that um, your brain doesn't have to become heavily involved in telling your body how to move. Um, because caffeine is a central nervous system stimulant, it speeds up the responses of the nervous system and things that don't have to go through the brain to happen can happen more quickly. On the downside, caffeine can cause insomnia, again, because it's a central nervous system stimulant. Same thing for nervousness and same thing for irritability. So not all good news, not all bad news. That's our summary of stimulating beverages. Additional effects of caffeine that have recently been studied. Um, remember I said there were studies of birth defects in caffeine um, that weren't uh, always conclusive. But a recent study in 2008 um, seems to fairly well link caffeine consum consumption to instances of low birth weight. Um, 100 to 199 milligrams per day, which is roughly a cup of coffee to two cups of coffee or so a day, um, there was a 20% increase in the instances of low birth rate um, with consumption of 200, 299 milligrams a day, um, two to three cups of coffee, uh, regular coffee per day in an eight ounce cup, keep in mind, not the uh, large uh, sizes that we normally consume coffee in. There was a 50% increase in low birth weight. Um, interesting, alcohol had similar effects and the association of low birth weight was held throughout a woman's pregnancy. Finally, we have a chart here showing the amount of caffeine in various drinks um, from regular coffee, drip type coffee, in an eight ounce cup, 95 milligrams. An eight ounce cup would be a standard coffee cup or even a little smaller, a small size coffee at uh, you know, a fast food restaurant or something. Um, Espresso in a two ounce cup has even more caffeine, 128 milligrams. Colas, normal colas, um, have in a 12 ounce serving about 30 milligrams of caffeine. Um, lemon lime uh, drinks with caffeine added in a 12 ounce serving, about 55 milligrams. That would include things like Mountain Dew. Um, Red Bull, uh, 8.3 ounce serving, 77 milligrams. Black tea, about 42 milligrams in an 8 ounce serving. And hot chocolate in a 6 ounce serving, only about 5 milligrams of caffeine. So coffee, particularly espresso, highest caffeine content of our commonly consumed stimulating beverages.